Didn't see you since the, we both retired, I think, down in Kerry's office. Yeah. Yeah. Remember they had to use the camera meeting, didn't they? Yes. Yeah. 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 Oh, you take your coat off? Yeah, it's good to see you. Good to see you. How are you? I'm Jeff. I'm sorry. 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 I'm sorry
heck, call the Cuban Missile Crisis a small event. <laughs> it was a pretty big event. But each of those was a pretty discreet event. Yeah. Um, they made MIT a grant, which is somewhat different in that it covers a broader range. It is the history of the early history of the computer. Now, obviously, it's not unlimited. We can't do it entirely. But what we've done is we've brought together a group that worked on ENIAC. We brought together a group that worked on the IAS computer. Uh, we brought together a group that uh, worked on the development of time sharing. We brought together uh, a group for Whirlwind. Uh, we also had one session on uh, some of the prehistory uh, electronics work during World War II uh, before application of the computer. And uh, <clears throat> the last in this series uh, that will exhaust uh, this long funding uh, is uh, uh, on the uh, 701. We wanted to bring this <coughs> series to the point where the computer moved from being uh, a series of one-at-a-time experiments in different universities and so on to uh, the computer moving into a tool into business, into applications, into industry. And uh, I've been tremendously impressed as I've been reading the things that Dr. Heard and some of you have been writing at the difference in the atmosphere mm -hmm. that comes through as, you, <laughs> as, I, as I read about uh, the, uh, the effort at IBM where it was toward a product that was produced in quantity manufactured uh, with, with an eye on a market, <coughs> and uh, the, these one-at-a-time uh, earlier efforts that we talked about. So what we have in mind is a completely informal discussion. There is a good deal already written. We don't object to the fact that we're going to be repeating things that uh, you can find by reading the annals. That's, there's no rule that says nothing said here today can't have been said before. But we do want to take advantage of the, of the nature of the medium to do things that or, aren't ordinarily done when people sit down and write an article. When people sit down and write an article, it tends to be rather formal. You leave out a bit of the atmosphere. You leave out the interactions. You leave out the human dimensions. Um, we want to get into that. We want to, want to get into you as people, how you got interested in the subject, what brought you to it. Uh, we want to get into... Uh, the uh, relationships that existed among a diversity of efforts, uh, many of which were uh, all looking towards the same thing. I mean, the, there were lots of people thinking about uh, how to move from the estab from the 604 to uh, uh, to a, another generation of uh, different kind of uh, of uh, computing and so on. And what was what was what did it feel like at the time? And how did people uh, feel about it then. And if we can recapture that in your discussion, that's, that's what we want to do. Now, I'm not going to sit here. I'm going to be back there. Richard's going to be back there. Yes. Uh, Before we start. Uh, just a second. I'm not quite there. there yet. But, uh, Richard and I reserve one privilege, and that is that as you talk, uh, if we feel that there's something that isn't coming through to us and that We'd like to see you expand on a little bit and so on. We'll just walk up here, walk into the in front of the camera and ask questions. But for the rest of the time, it's it's you people who were involved in this together, and you'll be talking and, and we'll be out of there. Now, Richard, uh, Doctor, we just a second. Did you met, <clears throat> did you say the first project was Project Charles? It was a safe system. The project Charles uh, was a preliminary to the safe system. Yeah. Because I start after I left the 701, I went on with the SAGE system. Yes. Matter of fact, we built the first model that we sent over here to Lincoln Lab in the same test cells that I've been building the 701. Yes. Gipsy. Oh, really? That's I interesting. I worked with Bob Everett and Jay Foster. And, uh, yes. That's the two names I remember. Yeah. Right now, Charles was, Charles was the project, was the summer study that asked the question, uh, is the United States safe? Yeah. And do mm -hmm. we need some sort of air defense? Wasn't the University of Michigan doing a similar study? The University at the same of Michigan time? Uh, was a, a, a little later on when Charles uh, sort of said, yes, we do. 
then there were two efforts made to uh, implement. One was here and one was at Michigan. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Yes. And I met Everett and Bob and uh, yeah, they came over to Poughkeepsie when we were building the 701 to see if we knew what the hell we were doing. <laughs> see, <laughs> well, if we we see if we could get a subcontract uh, yeah. to build the model. Well, uh, uh, Richard has a proposal for how we start out today. Uh, you wanted to play the... We have the uh, 701 days tape. We feel like we probably haven't seen it for quite a while. <clears throat> so you might want to look at it. It's only 13 minutes. It might give you some ideas. And we're going to videotape you watching it. So we have to kill these lights. But bring me an ashtray sometime okay. during and, the session. Uh, Not right away. Coffee, coffee, coffee through. Uh, the coffee first 30 years that's don't a, count. I didn't know it was a hazard. <laughs> that's a, that's a yes, <laughs> and you're, you're welcome to get up and get yourself coffee and uh, fruit. Is <coughs> anything, anytime. I mean, it's very informal. God, I'd love to get a tape of that. I've got the movie. I have a movie. This is a tape. I can't play it. Yeah, I, I have no 16 yeah. millimeter machine. We can make dust. Yeah, but you, you haven't got the... Uh, can you make them on the home cassette? You got it. Yeah. VHS, Betamax, yeah. two inch. They, they gave me half inch and three quarters, so probably no trouble with this ass guy. Oh, really? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah, I have a 16 millimeter movie, which yeah, I've, they never, were nice I've never opened movie. the box. We started this project on the third floor of the Tire Factory. See that right? Yeah. And we finished it in a supermarket, which was later called the South Road Laboratory Annex. It was a... We bought a magnetic tape from 3M or somebody, and it came in probably looking like a Scotch tape box. So when I got down to receiving inspection, the guy had about 100 feet of tape on the floor. I told him, what's the matter? The guy said, there's no adhesive on it. I remember that one. No stick on it. Yeah, John was working for me. Oh, yeah. I remember the guy's name, Charlie Brock. That's when the first part started coming in. I think the thing that's most important about the 701 is that it got IBM into the computer business. And I think we all realized at that point in time that this was a new business. Uh, this potential was fantastic. Of course, we were all, we were a bunch of young bucks, and we were building what we considered the largest, fastest, first big electronic computer. We felt that we were kind of a first of a new generation of people that understood this thing called uh, stored program systems and had a fair chance of making them work. It was just like by catching, catching a wave, uh, riding it in. That's, what, that's, that's, what I, that's the way I look at my career. I was really very lucky. To my knowledge, the significance of the 701 was to prove that if, uh, if you had the kind of uh, belief and faith in what the computing world was going to become that, that quite obviously Tom Watson and Ralph Palmer and others had, and if you were to put your money where your belief was, which is what Tom Watson did, but by that you could go into production on supercomputers. We actually, my mother always told me to put my gum out before any crisis. When it's crawling. Actually, I think we thought in those early days that we either had to win this one or fail as a company. And that's why I think everybody puts their chest into it. It was really in January 1950 that the decision was made to go ahead and actually market a computer. Cuthbert Hurd was responsible for uh, for the sales side of the 701 project, and Jerry Hedera and I were responsible for the engineering part, and we were sort of teamed up together trying to make this thing go. We uh, predicting what what we could what we could what we could build, and he going out to line up customers that we were dealing with electronics for the first time on a very large scale we built some electronic multipliers but they were card impulsed and uh, worked rather slowly the electronics worked rapidly but the feed mechanism was card now we were trying to take a piece of electronic tape with literally thousands of impulses and relatively short pieces of tape and put them into a machine and take them out the problem that we had was that there were very many people who knew what should be done. And all these, there were lots of different ideas as to what should be done. There were uh, executives telling us to do this, and executives telling us not to do this and do that instead. And so Tom called a meeting uh, in which he had 
most of the people who were most interested in the subject. But some of us had decided that we just had to force ourselves into magnetic tape. And I wanted to get everybody's views out on the table as to who was going to fight against it. And of course, when you have a meeting like that and you state this new position is going to be for it, it uh, has a, a, a helpful, a helpful, he went all around the room asking people whether this was the right thing to do or not. And uh, some people said yes, and some people said other things. And then he told those, all of those, those people who had said other things that uh, they should uh, work on other problems and uh, leave the 701 alone. He really backed us, and without his backing, we would not have been successful. Pencil had a hit paper January 1st, 1951, and December 30th or 31st, 1952, the first production machine went from Poughkeepsie down to uh, 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 corporate headquarters, world headquarters, in 590. So that's something under two years to design the machine, build an engineering model, shake down all the trouble, new technology, brand new technology, get it tested, fix it up, and so forth, get the manufacturing line started, and get the first machine off the manufacturing line with something brand new. I was pretty young in the company, but I had enough uh, moxie to go down and go there and say, we got to do something different. And uh, so this is when I asked for, you know, my own artsy man, production control, tool engineer, and uh, a couple of managers to lay out and plan the resources for manufacturing and testing that. So pulling together that team and getting in very early into a program, like the next birth, really, yeah, uh, very close to it, that enabled us to pull it off. We, we just didn't have enough people in Poughkeepsie or in the company at that time that were uncommitted in order to do this kind of work. And so Ralph Palmer went out and had, uh, uh, had us hire 30 guys with master's degrees who came in with the company on the basis that they would help with the design of, 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 the, of the machine and uh, then go out with the machine as the first customer engineers. Uh, we have uh, been able to resurrect some pictures of, of those groups. And uh, you look at that group of uh, 30 or so fellows today, and it's kind of like a who's who in IBM. Christ. Well, now having these fellows fresh out of school, we determined that the best thing to do was have an hour's class first thing in the morning every day. You just bring these 30 guys up, teaching them what computer techniques were known at that time. A fellow named John Coombs did it. He used to call it Coombs College of Computer Knowledge. We had a lot of uh, new technologies. Uh, we were using two diode logic. Uh, it was the first time we had a real application of magnetic tape. We had made magnetic drum memories before, but not in Poughkeepsie, and uh, not quite the same size. None of the Machines that had been worked on in colleges and universities had used printers or card input-output devices. To me, it was a very strange machine because I've been used to a machine that its predecessor, the SSEC, that was very slow and noisy and, and uh, sort of science fiction machine that, that you could tell where it was, you know, in executing your program. Yeah, yeah, you could, you could tell by the rhythm of the sound, you know, just what part of the program it was doing. And so we felt that, uh, you know, it was an unusual experience to meet a machine that was all in, in a box that just flashlights and did things a thousand times faster than we were accustomed to. It's true about the circumstances surrounding the writing of that first assembly program? <laughs> well, what happened is <clears throat> we were extremely busy working on the 701 project, and I had this idea, and uh, I wanted to work on it, but never got time to until uh, one morning uh, I woke up, and my wife woke up, and we looked at each other, and and uh, I said, I have monks. And she said, I have monks, too. <laughs> uh, that was pretty tough. And I, she was uh, expecting our fourth child at that time. So I took care of her, which is not very good for a man to do. And uh, so I, had a, I eventually came down with a very bad case of monks. And uh, while I was convalescing from that, I wrote the first assembly program. And the 701 was done for quite a few minutes, maybe half an hour. 
wrong without making a mistake, but it seemed inevitable that if it was going to make a mistake, it would do it in the middle of a demonstration. <laughs> we had uh, 10 top customers come in for a week to uh, spend three or four days learning how to use the machine and come in and actually put the little problems on the machine. We worked feverishly to get it ready as the door was opening and 10 outside executives were walking in. One of us slipped the scope probe, shorted about 100 diodes cleaned it down for two weeks while we, the fellow I worked with, who should probably be unnamed, uh, after uh, joined the company the same day I did, and after uh, several weeks had earned enough money to buy a couple of new suits. And uh, he had uh, he had bought one suit at uh, Robert Hall's for $45. And the second suit he bought from a custom tailor and signed $25, which was a lot of money for a suit in those days. And uh, he was so taken by himself in that suit that he wore in on third shift. Somewhere about four in the morning, he was standing by the central console of the machine. He stood for a long time sniffing the air, and he said, I smell chicken feathers. And I stopped working, looked up, and said, I smell chicken feathers, too. And we both looked around, and as he turned around, I saw his pants were on fire. He backed into the he backed into the siding iron. And those really are kind of stupid stories, aren't right? they? You know, you, you make the most progress and have the uh, greatest profit from projects which are the most fun and which people are dedicated to as individuals and as a team. Jerry had had our leader was a real class master, but he'd go for ahead to go as hard as we wanted to and as long as we wanted to go. We didn't have budgets and schedules in those days. Uh, Maybe that's why we did things so fast. Uh, but you didn't have a you didn't have a schedule to slow you down. You know to tell you that you to tell you that you shouldn't be done quite yet. <laughs> but you have to you have until next week. We worked seven days a week around the around the clock, twenty four hours a day, and so we had three or four shifts that populated the checkout of the of the machine. Oh yes, uh, a lot of times we work down with the. Bill Mayer days, one time he called me and wanted to know I had, why I hadn't punched out on Wednesday afternoon because I punched on Monday. So the reason was I hadn't gone home. <laughs> he was kind of provoked, but uh, I wasn't paying attention to the punch card method. There was a lot of pressure, wasn't there? Yes, there was. I hope there always is. Who are you to? I guess Terry Christie had to come in and wear a vest when we were put out uh, for ourselves, very challenging, demanding things to be accomplished, uh, and uh, the tougher they are and the more outstanding we are, the, the better we, we react with each other, and the better we perform in the marketplace and, and in the technology world as well. The most pressure, the most pressure was self-generated pressure. Uh, Self-generated in the sense that everybody was enthusiastic. We knew we were doing something important. It was a, it was a first time through. I think we all realized we were kind of on a frontier of some type. And uh, yeah, it was very true when we thought we were on the frontier in those days. But my feeling is, and I think that we really saw where the frontier hasn't, hasn't even, even changed. And the horizon still will seem to be as far out and, and broader than ever. My, for my, we had to have a problem solving anything. And have all the challenges yet met or even even uh, even bring them. You think it's the end or the beginning? Oh, it's always the beginning. Yeah, I am too. Always <laughs> oh, <wait, no. laughs> uh, Just as someone who's slowly moving out of the active scene in IBM, I'd like to use the opportunity of expressing my own appreciation to everyone who worked on the project. A lot of them are still in IBM. Some of them work for our worthy competitors, but as a team in those days, they were absolutely unbeatable, and they were the nucleus of all of the teams that have created the computers that we've had since. So, in a very real way, they helped me build a business reputation which was more their credit than my own, and uh, so it's made my life fruitful and happy, and I'm very grateful for them. That was a good flick. That was good. Yeah. Yeah. Why don't we start out by having you comment on, on that, see if there's something you think you, know, you want to add or uh, that you think, you know, how do you feel that uh, this really captured? And why don't we ask Nat to act as a kind of uh, half moderator that is if 
if pe several people want to talk at once, you just uh, point at somebody or something like that. <coughs> okay, well, <coughs> I'll, I'll be glad to do that. So who would like to make a comment on uh, the 701 movie? Well, I was very pleased uh, when I learned they were going to, to make the 701 movie. And uh, I just about fell out of my chair when they first shown in our meeting in New York City and the opening scene there, I was bigger than life and <laughs> talking about the supermarket and the the, uh, the physical facilities we started in, which were really not very important, but uh, someone had selected those as the things that they thought would be a, an opening. Well, we, we moved around quite a bit. We actually yeah. started the thing on High Street, if you remember. Fact, yeah. I said the third floor of the tire and then finished it in the supermarket. Right. There too, yeah. uh -huh. That was a supermarket that never became a supermarket. That's right. Yeah. Yes. I've got that film home, but this is the first time I've seen it because I don't have a projector. <laughs> <laughs> I, guess they, I guess they gave each of us a copy of the film. Yeah. But 16 millimeter projectors are not particularly standard equipment in the home. Well, I had no trouble with that because my wife is a school teacher, and so she just brought one home from school. Good. <clears throat> See, that's exactly yeah, ten. Yeah, I, I tell you, then. though, to get started on, on, on this a little different approach, I always felt from the time I joined the company in 1945 that th th I couldn't see the distinction between punch card accounting machines and computers. I mean, you, you know, that, that, that distinction that so many people in IBM had Matt and that you that you focused on in a lot of your in a lot of your writing and discussion is something that used to mystify me. I couldn't understand why the technology played that important a role in their thinking. It seemed to me that electronics was just a much better, faster way to get done the very same things that had been done for years with electromechanical things and with punch cards. Sure. And I would hear these guys in in the the senior guys in IBM, you know, talking about should we or should we not get into electronics. And it, it always puzzled me as to why that was ever a, a, a matter of discussion. It just seemed so obvious to me that, hey, you know. Uh, you know, from the plant point of view, we had a plant in Poughkeepsie building high production of mechanical machines, typewriters, key punches, sorters. Mm -hmm. well, these were tool engineers. They didn't know what the hell a vacuum tube was or wow. the radio or not. Yeah, but they did, <coughs> they did all right, know, uh, they did all right on the 604. Well, we had a little corner over in the plant there, you know, and the rest of the guys didn't greet this technology with open arms. You I they were different. they were different types? Well, it was a threat to their futures. Uh, mm -hmm. you know, where the hell is a tool maker going to go in the, in the vacuum <laughs> tube business? Uh, that was that feeling. And, uh, you know, we were, what, one-tenth of the total or less. population or less. Uh, mm -hmm. Well, I agree with you, Jerry. I mean, why I came to IBM... To, to, to be in the uh, computer revolution. Right. Uh, I mean, I'd, uh, I mean I'd, I'd, I'd started here. Uh, uh, I had a contract when I was in Sylvania to build the arithmetic unit of Whirlwind 1 for MIT. And uh, it was listening to Bob Everett's course on computers that got me fired up. And I decided this was very important. And we had to, uh, and, and I, sh I, should, I should somehow, the, the world was going to change and I should be in the midst of it. And I came to the MIT library here and studied American industry and concluded that, concluded that uh, IBM was where the action was going to be, so I applied for a job. Well, you had, you had great faith, believe me, because if you remember, there were all these debates going on as to whether that was the right thing to do or not. I still remember that after the 701, when 1953, when I went to Endicott as the lab manager, uh, <clears throat> I bumped into a financial guy, Hillary Faw, uh, who had come up from New York, and we were both eating in the same restaurant, so we ate together. And he was hanging crepe all over the place. I, I said, well, you know, what's the matter, Hillary? He said, we just sold the company down the road. Hmm. And I said, what are you talking about? He said, we just decided to take the profits from all those wonderful punch card machines and put them into electronics instead of back into more punch card machines. I said, help you. What the hell is wrong with that? <laughs> but he, he was absolutely demolished. The, the poor man mm -hmm. was beside himself, thinking that the company had just sold its birthright. I remember going to a meeting <coughs> for 590 with uh, old Bibby and Bill Mayer, long toward the end of the 701 program. <coughs> and the question was, should we go on with the 702? Yeah. 
And the reason I was there to tell him, yeah, yeah. The reason I was there to tell him I had 150 people working on a 701. If we didn't keep going, what would I do with 100, <laughs> 150 people, electronic people? But yeah, a George Richter and some of those fellows yeah. thought we were, we saturated the world with computer power. I think Hillary Fall kept a book on the 701 for a long time as to when it would cross over. And Never we, did. We had many conversations. And I said, "There's more to it than just a 701. There's a one." Tremendous amount of uh, learning throughout the corporation that's well, spreading into into subsequent products. You know, whenever I'm asked about that, <clears throat> I point out that, that the uh, engineering part of the seven one is really a hell of a lot different from the engineering part of any machine that had come ahead of that, including mm -hmm. the SSEC. Because mm -hmm. when they built the SSEC and the old Harvard machine, the Mark One that Aiken was involved in, they treated those machines just the way they treated the smaller machines. And In what way, Jerry? What well, mean? they essentially had a great big layout. There was one team that worked on the whole machine. It, it wasn't broken up into pieces. And, and But we started the 701. I mean, it became obvious that we that to get it done in the time, it was, it was the time really that Moved us more than anything else. The, the 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 requested speed of development. Uh, so there's only one way to get it done in that little time, and that is to break the problem up into pieces, mm -hmm. and and to have do it all in parallel. Do it all in parallel. You, you mm -hmm. know, you had a part of it. Yeah. Uh, Lou Stevens had a part of it. Max Femmer had a part of it. Phil Howie Fox. Musell yeah. had a part. Yeah. Phil Fox, and so on, and Harold Ross. And we, we broke it up that way, and before we did, we, we, before we could move ahead, we had to develop what was a design manual. I remember that, yes. Well, let me tell you, for three months, I suffered no end of pain because Ralph Palmer would come by, and he'd want to know where the machine was, where the design was, and I'd say, we're working on a design manual. And, you know, it just didn't connect. Nobody had ever worked on these, and I, yeah. I said, well, if we're going to have six or seven groups all working independently, they've got to work to a set of rules, and we're developing those rules. Mm -hmm. and that was the first time that had been done. Mm -hmm. And the, the, the craziness of having uh, a drawing for the machine that was about that big, if you were a lot thicker and many, many, but to put the, the drawings for the machine and, into logical diagrams and, and so forth on eight and a half by 11 sheets mm -hmm. was also brand new because up until that time, you made a blueprint of a machine on a big piece of paper. And the bigger the machine, the bigger the, bigger the piece paper. of paper. Yeah. <laughs> and and we, we just knew we couldn't do that with this, with this project. So we had to develop a whole new set of engineering practice at the time that I think a lot of people weren't aware of, but it was a it was a tremendous departure from what had gone on before. And and it may not have seemed obvious to a lot of people, but it, it was it was a struggle because it was flying in the face of what had been conventional practice up until then. Sure. You may I, excuse me. Go ahead. I, I remember that and a strong thing that motivated you uh, in developing that manual was the experience with the tape processing machine. Right. Uh, which was our first computer. It never right. saw. It never became a product. But it was uh, each each engineer who had a part designed it his own way. Yeah, and test it, assembly. It came yeah. out to be a, yeah. a tremendous collection of of uh, diverse parts, right. and it was obvious, uh, particularly to you, but also the rest of us, that uh, the design had to be in a much more disciplined way if we, if we were going to have a machine that could be maintained. Right. Well, if you recall, we designed all these standard circuits, and then we said to the development groups, the various development groups, the one under Frizz, etc., you got to use these standard circuits. Well, of course, they got to the point where they just simply needed to have a special circuit, and so the, the circuit design group was really never disbanded. <clears throat> Maury, uh, Giff Maury, wasn't Giff it? Maury. Yeah. yeah. More. Wasn't it I good? had another name, but uh, Giff Murray was one, but yeah. Owen McSorley. And Owen McSorley. Both yeah. those guys were kind of our circuit group. Mm -hmm. And if Frizz wanted to design a special circuit, he would either go to them and have them do it, 
Or if he did it himself when he was through, he had to take it to them. Get their blessing. And get their blessing because we I didn't want anybody requiring another power supply. They would document it. They would document it. <laughs> yeah. So if anyone else with similar requirements would then be forced to use my circuit as one of the new standards. Well all of that all of that was kind of new. The important thing about that is that when it came time to do the seven oh two, the seven oh four, the seven oh five, the follow on machines, if you will. Mm -hmm that all of that procedure and practice had essentially been worked out and, and it just kept getting more and more refined as time went on. But that was probably as much of a contribution to the computer business or the electronics business, mm -hmm. the large electronics business, as, as anything else. Mm -hmm. Jerry, what you're saying is extremely interesting and I'd like to explore it. Yeah. You're saying it was a first. It was first in IBM because the earlier machines were smaller. But of course, this was a period of change, of big change in the whole field of elect electrical engineering. It was a new thing. That's right. Now, was, was this something that grew out of of the uh, of the war, out of the big developments like radar developments? Was it something that was happening elsewhere in the discipline? Uh, was it something that was unique to this situation? Yeah. Well, let me expand a little. There had been. Prior to the war, in the late 30s, mid to late 30s, there had been a small group of people in the IBM Endicott laboratory who had worked on flip-flops and gates and things using electron tubes. Uh, IBM in those days had a penchant not to publish. So a lot of that work, while it... it did get communicated by word of mouth and because of the war and these people going into the war effort it was never really it never really hit the literature and and so a lot of the fundamental techniques from an engineering standpoint now were lying ready to be used as vacuum tubes got better and cheaper after the war and it was really the war that did that and the 604 came out of the 603 and the 604 mm -hmm. came really out of out of that inventory of intellectual effort that had been expended in, in, in IBM in the late 30s, but had been added to tremendously because of the war and because of the advances demanded by radar and things like that. But it was not directly radar in and of itself that led to this. There had been previous work. And, and as a matter of fact, there was a lot of work at Los Alamos uh, and other places dealing with the atomic uh, uh, weapons program. I, I still remember I was at Cornell University, a student interested in, in, in this kind of thing, and I went to the library to, to, to read up on what we used to call Eccles-Jordan circuits, these are the earliest flip-flops. They said, well, the book is out. It's been gone for six months. Well, I said, get it. And so they, they finally tore it loose from the graduate student that had it. And when I got the book, it literally fell open to the flip-flop page. I mean, nothing else in that book had been read. Hmm. So that there was intense interest in, in these digital-type circuits. Uh, they were beginning to use them at Los Alamos for, for measuring time mm -hmm. and for measuring s speed and things like that. But the fundamental... Gates and, and accumulators and uh, and things like that had been worked out to a very dramatic degree uh, prior to the war and had been refined and improved in reliability and speed and so forth during the war. Uh, sure, it was a big revolution. The the, uh, uh, the perhaps the biggest part of the revolution was in the area of of, of not just the engineering, but in the area of Nat Rochester's uh, uh, interest and expertise, and that's on the architecture and the structure of the computing system. You've got to remember, the 604, I believe, had 1,200 tubes, didn't it, Dick? Well, 1,214, depending yeah. on options. Mm -hmm. And we were chugging those, Dick was chugging those things out of the IBM factory in Poughkeepsie, at first at the rate of 25 a month, then 50, 50 a month, and then I think he actually went up to 100 at one oh, point. I guess that, well, when I was on the 701, yeah. I that's true. We well, had more vacuum tubes in the field 
computers than anybody in the world. And RCA used to come to us to find out uh, how the tools were working because we had a lot of data. They never kept data on radio or TV. Mm. But we knew uh, now why they didn't work. They were dirty. That's why they didn't work. <laughs> so on, the the inside. Point, the, the, on the inside. On the inside. <laughs> the reason I bring up the 604, it, <coughs> it started off as a small machine effort, you know, with a few machines a month. But it, it, it went 40 for to a, fill the world. That's it went started. a long time. At a hundred machines a month, and I think at one point there was something like ten thousand, ten thousand machines out in the field, and so that's a lot of electronics working out there. And as a matter of fact, it was more vacuum tubes in service at one point. I recall more vacuum tubes in service than the U.S. government had was on that six hundred four. Now the big difference between the six hundred four and the seven hundred one was in a sense, less in the electronics and more in the size and sweep of the thing, but more particularly in the organization and structure. And the 701 was... A well, a whole new series of technologies come in, drum and tape, yeah, magnetic but, the, but that wasn't fundamental. Is yeah, the, the architecture is another very important yeah. aspect. Uh, and to my way of looking at it, these machines were very different from the machines that have been made before. Because uh, back in 1936, uh, Turing had proved that it was possible to build a, a universal machine. It was a mathematical proof. Uh, this machine would be able to solve any problem that any machine could solve, provided uh, you were willing to write the program for it and you were willing to pay for it to run and wait for it to finish. And for the first time, we were marketing one of these universal machines. And... Uh, and the symptom of that is, of course, that any one of these machines can can emulate any other machine, not not too efficiently, but get the work done. Well, when we lay, laid out the architecture of this machine, the minimal size of it was still a pretty impressive lot, a lot of hardware, and we had a short schedule for developing it. And then after we developed it, developed it, we had to make sure it would run. And uh, the more complicated it was, the more difficult it would be to get it designed and built, and the more difficult it would be to keep, it, keep them running in the field. So when we laid out the architecture, we eliminated from the hardware everything that we reasonably could eliminate from hardware to move into software. We, we called it a Spartan machine. If you right, mm -hmm. and, that, and that was intentional. For instance, it didn't have floating point. If you wanted to write a program that used floating point, you had to use uh, subroutines to add, subtract, multiply, and divide. And there were, uh, it didn't have indexing. So you had to write programs to calculate as you uh, went, went from one step to the next. You had to increment a, use the add instruction to increment a variable, uh, things that are automatic in computers today. Uh, and then another important part was we had to, everybody had to work on the same machine. Uh, so the first thing that we did, the, the way the output of the architecture group uh, was a user's manual. Uh, so so, so the, you, 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 your people designing the computer uh, were working on the same machine that the, uh, that the programmers were working on. Uh, that we had the prime shift, the programmers had the third shift. <laughs> right. Oh, but the, no, I, I, didn't, I didn't mean the same hardware. I was thinking of earlier, earlier before there was any hardware. They were writing programs. <coughs> we were writing programs. We were exp exp looking into more a architectural aspects, yes. and and you were designing hardware. And we had to make sure we were both talking about the same machine. That's why we had to begin with a with a, a preliminary edition of a yeah. user's manual. That was really a very first. You maybe weren't as involved, but the the effort to structure the machine to organize it. Uh, was really a, a a very tough, short effort that Nat and Cuthbert Hurd and their groups kind of got together on, along with I guess the future demands people uh, as well. <coughs> but in a in a remarkably short time, they said, "Here's what we want this machine to do," and. and uh, uh, all these instructions and machine commands will hang together. Mm -hmm. And if you can make the machine do these things and work at these speeds, we've got, we've got a, a, a logically consistent and useful gadget 
uh, that that we can go to market with, and that was done in a period, I believe, of a few relatively few weeks, wasn't it? Uh, six yes. weeks or something. Was that prior to January fifty-one? No, no, that or was during after. After, in other words, after, after, after in January of fifty-one, mm -hmm. I was told, you know, engineer the machine. So I mm -hmm. knew I had a lot of engineering work to do, mm -hmm. and that's when. We were at the tie factory. Together, and, yes. yeah. But meanwhile, Nat had gotten together, been told to get together with her and so forth. And yes, well, I also the team consisted of Werner Buckles mm -hmm. and um, Mort, Mort Astrahan. Mort Those were my chief assistants in this, and then some more people. Oh, Murphy, Bob too. Murphy. Bob, Bob, Bob Murphy, Murphy yeah. and John Coombs. There were, there were others, but the primary ones were uh, Buckles and Astrahan yeah. and I, who uh, worked up a a detailed plan for the machine, not the not the not the circuit details, but the no, no, logic. No, no. I mean, logic. I was off working on that. You see, sure, with all sure. of you, you yes, people. Yes. Uh, whereas, in the meantime, the these fellows were getting together on a very impressively short time schedule. They planned the machine. Mm -hmm. They planned the machine from a user point of view. They planned the machine from the standpoint of how it should hang together. And uh, I still remember Herb Grosh, for instance, was part of that. Mm. Yeah. He bought one of the machines for GE. Uh, he yes. came up and lived with me for a while. Yes. You know, with a little more effort and programming on your part, I wouldn't have had to chase those damn many parts around. It. <laughs> 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 Maybe you could have looked at it harder. <laughs> well, if you did it in six weeks, which is an extraordinary accomplishment, obviously you had a lot of the ideas before you came into those six weeks. What were, what were the key pieces that, that you had in mind already, That uh, the, the key concepts that, that you were able to bring together in your group in six weeks? Well, uh, to begin with, uh, uh, Turing had invented the uh, had written this paper which described this re remarkable machine. And then during the war, he was in the he was in the British uh, uh, equivalent of NSA code breaking activity. And the details of this are fairly unclear. But Morris Wilkes was part of that. And von Neumann had, had access to it. And then somehow, coming out of this, and the de details are very unclear, um, the, the people have died, things have not been declassified, and so forth. But von Neumann uh, came out with a description of a computer, which was absolutely remarkable. Uh, and uh, before, all the other machines had been sort of kludges, to use modern terminology. And von Neumann had this marvelous ability to see things clearly. And so there was a summer school in 1956, which uh, at the University of Pennsylvania. 46. 46, 46. I'm sorry, 46. Uh, and uh, uh, Bob Everett was one of the people that went to that. And he uh, he came back and uh, was one of the key people in the, in the Whirlwind One project. And I, I was at Sylvania, and I built the arithmetic unit for it, and I learned about it. And so I understood this, and also... Somewhere along the line, I read Turing's paper, and I read uh, what, the, what von Neumann had done. And so all of these things were known. Uh, and uh, then we um, went to work to uh, apply them to IBM's work. Uh, that is, Jerry and I were convinced this was, this was the direction where the future was. Uh, and Ralph Palmer, uh, to whom we reported, was also convinced. That, and, he was one of uh, he was a very remarkable person who had a lot to do with making this thing go, uh, and so we wanted to uh, we wanted to apply it to IBM's main area of business, which is com which is processing commercial uh, information in business. Uh, we thought that's where the main effect would, would would take place, but we could never get IBM to go along with the idea of spending a lot of money to design such a product until uh, suddenly they began to get scared uh, uh, about of magnetic tape. Not of computers, but of magnetic tape. And uh, they, uh, so... Uh, this is all prior to the 701. Prior to the 701. Mm -hmm. But this is, you, you asked, you asked how, how, how could we have possibly done it in that length of time? Is that a wire We were standing on the shoulders of giants and we'd done a lot of homework ourselves. Uh, the... Uh, so a magnetic tape project was authorized. IBM thought of itself as a punch card company, uh, not a not a not not a 
calculator company or an accounting machine company or anything like that, a punch card company. We made we sold punch cards. We showed, sold whatever had to be done to Use a lot. <laughs> Fast. Uh, and also to make them, they were very profitable. Yeah. Was, uh, we had a uh, we had, we had a, a, a patented way of a, a press that created them that better and cheaper than anybody else. Um, but they got worried about magnetic tape. Well, we we said yes, magnetic. Uh, we found that magnetic tape was a problem, a challenge, and an opportunity. But you, you had to have a computer to make it work to use it. You had to process magnetic tape, and so out of this came the. A, a, the predecessor of the seven, one predecessor of the 701, which was the tape processing machine that was intended to be a, uh, a commercial data, a commercial computer. And uh, we learned a whole lot from that. We also learned a lot, I mean, we'd learned a lot from what other people had done from Whirlwind here at MIT, from the machine at the Institute for Advanced Study that von Neumann was uh, putting together. And from talking to lots of other people and seeing other machines elsewhere, so when we suddenly had to uh, come up with a architecture of a computer uh, to meet certain to meet the control a certain market requirement of scientific computing, we knew pretty well what to do, uh, and we had a lot of technology. We had tape, drums, uh, memory, all kinds of things, all all sorts of tools just ready to put together, and we knew the general structure that they had to be in, so uh, it, we, we were able to work fast. But it's fair to add that up until this time, all of the other computers that had been designed and worked on at colleges or by Eckert and Walkley, etc., were all paper tape oriented, pretty much, and did not have other than a, uh, uh, a teletype printer associated with it. I mean, to my recollection, none of them included the kind of input-output that we incorporated into the 701 because we had them handy, and the other, I guess the other people didn't, didn't see the need or, or have them quite as handy. Did well, Univac have there was a metal tape? tape uh, uh, yeah, they had yeah. a metal tape. <laughs> yeah, that, that was the exception. Uni Univac was designed to be a commercial data processing right. machine, and, and they, they, they were using metal tape, which, was, uh, which worked all right, but uh, it, was, it was far too expensive and heavy. I mean, the, the moment of inertia of a, of a spinning reel is in, un, inconceivable. Yeah. Uh, and so we, and we used uh, plastic tape. Which we were able to make work very well, uh, and the uh, but there were, there were a, lot, a, lot, a lot of very good engineering went into making it work well. Uh, Jim Jim Weidenhammer doing the mechanical engineering of it, and you'll remember the name of the people that did the electrical engineering on it, but I don't. Uh, well, Femmer and his gang were. Yeah, well, Buslick, probably. Buslick, well, Buslick, yes. Yeah, well, yeah. he no, he did. He was mechanical too. Okay. Uh -huh. Well, the, the point I'm trying to make that the 701 at the time it was conceived was a lot more elegant, fancy machine than its predecessor, immediate predecessors. Uh, at least it, it was. It, 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 it was conceived to be, you know, with we had line at a time printers at 150 lines a minute, you know, 80, sure. 80 or whatever uh, characters. 120 to the line. column. 120 column. Yeah. Okay. Uh, we had punch cards read into it. We had punch card output, and we had these magnetic tapes which were acetate, and which at the time, I guess, were the fastest. We only were using 100 bits per linear inch. Yeah, so but the still, the, the, was right. the start time and the stop time yeah. and so forth was, yeah. I believe, the fastest uh -huh. that had been achieved because of these problems that you're talking about with metal tape. And, and so we, had, we incorporated <coughs> into the 701 fast random access cathode ray storage, the, the, the Williams storage, the larger but slower magnetic drum storage, and we had card output and card input and printer output. And 
and that represented a very sophisticated, high-speed, high-capacity mix in comparison to anything that had gone on previously. Mm -hmm. And uh, yes, the uh, a very a very important thing was uh, was the punch cards uh, because other machines used uh, uh, paper, paper tape as input, and and paper tape is not nearly as good. That is, if you uh, uh, if if you want to change something on it, you have to change. Uh, if you want to change, if you have a program and you want to change one instruction, why well, you have to uh, cut a whole new tape. Whereas with uh, a deck of magnetic cards, you simply replace one card. Not magnetic, just punch cards. I'm sorry, card. with, a, with a set of punch cards, you simply replace one card, uh, or stick in a whole. You stick in a hundred cards in the middle of a two thousand card deck. I'm uh, smiling because I can remember the tremendous pressure and heat we were under after the 701 because none of our machines had punch paper tape and all the competitive machines had paper tape and the people <laughs> in the universities were all quite used to the paper tape business and we were always under huh? this tremendous heat and pressure yeah. why don't we have paper we're, tape we're, on our machines? Incompatible. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know speaking of the TPM and, uh, and some of the uh, precursor work remember I spent three months on social security with Jim Green uh, trying to see how you would apply the hundreds of thousands of records in an organization like that. And we came up with a, I brought all the data back to you, as I recall, the thousand uh, social security numbers per reel of tape, and then how many thousands of reels it would take and how they would process it. And this was in connection with the paper uh, uh, look-through of the TPM. You know, we had a yes. paper tape machine. Well, Carter yeah. Tape had a paper tape on it. Yeah, but, you know, it was seven, we, it was as Nat says, small. it was just a bad... It was a bad direction, and, and mm -hmm. we never really put our arms around it. Yeah, we, we made a, I guess we went out to this group of people on the West Coast that, that were ex-IBMers and that made paper tape equipment, and we said, okay, if, you know, we'll, we'll help people connect them to our machine if they want to, but we, we really don't think it's a very good idea. And it finally, after maybe five years, went away, but the, in the meantime... <laughs> We had to stand a lot, a lot of heat. You know, you mentioned earlier uh, about the uh, short overall time period that you were given. No, uh, that he was given. Well, I was given a little more time. Yeah. Well, I'm talking about the total two-year yeah. oh, time yeah. from the time you pulled the group together until we were supposed to ship one, and mentioned the, the size of the machine relative to that amount of time, and the fir then the only solution, necessity, kind of steps in and, and then creates the concept of breaking it up into pieces that could be done in parallel. What I'm leading up to is the unit testers, the standalone testers, which were a byproduct of that philosophy, just became an invaluable. And you would never, because you could not only uh, build and make the do the initial debugging on the drum frame or the tape frames or whatever, but any time you had a very complex problem within the system, while we were all still learning, you could break the system back down quickly into functional components and try to quickly determine, is this part all right or not? Yeah. And it was a it was an evolutionary way of trying to how do you find where a problem is in a in a room full of machinery? Yeah, we made a few mistakes along that line. Uh, probably is more my fault than anybody else's. But the the fact that we had a single large power supply mm -hmm. uh, meant that if we wanted to test any unit, we had to power up the entire machine. We, and we went away from that in subsequent designs. Mm -hmm. yeah, so that was a bad idea uh, to begin with. That would have uh, made those other boxes awful big. Yeah, that well, that's the that way. Well, yeah, but from then on, I mean, uh, did, from yeah, 702 yeah. on, we had independent power like, supplies so, yes. that, so that you could do exactly <coughs> mm -hmm. what Chris is talking about. You could take Isolate. a unit offline and, and, and work, uh, on it. work on it. Well, on the test floor, we kept one power supply separate from the rest of it so we could do well, this. And then there you are. Yes, we are. didn't have and the customer didn't have. No, no that, that you couldn't skip yes. that. Yes. The, the other thing that we did that in retrospect was a little bit uh, uh, impractical was we put two tape drives on a single unit. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and we did that so that the vacuum pump, the, you know, for, the, for the loops. Yeah, a lot of this... Power, the, a lot of the control circuitry and the and the mechanical stuff, the frame and so forth, all of that stuff could be shared between the two units and give us a lower unit cost. Well, as it turned out, that was not a very good idea. And, and again, the, the flexibility of, 
of having independent uh, units uh, uh, took the day. The very next but, models. But other other than that, I think the the big decision. You know, you talk about you talk about absurd, simple, obvious things. This was the first big machine that we that was put together that you could uncouple from itself and roll the individual units down a hall and into an elevator and through doorways. I mean, that was part of the rules that we put down, that we were not going to, by God, make a machine where you had to knock out the side of a building yeah. in, in order to move it in and then take six months to install it. You, you know, So that put a lot of these tremendous trifles of little little decisions that we made along the way that, that today seem so obvious, uh, but were, were big decisions in those days. You, know, you mentioned that tough schedule, and we shipped that first one to 590 over Christmas, but we had trouble getting into 590 because of all the traffic. Bo Evans was with the gang, <clears throat> put it together, started testing it, and the plant was, uh, the office was doing something upstairs with the cafeteria. Putting a new cafeteria and uh, <clears throat> some workman uh, using concrete let a pail of water, a lot of water come down through the oh, ceiling no. all over the machine. <laughs> Jesus, we had to rush parts down, new covers, <laughs> clean off the machine. <laughs> get it going again. I'm glad I don't remember that. <laughs> that, was, that was I remember Max and I driving down there two or three times a week for yeah. the next couple of months. Yeah. Yeah. Well, these, these crazy decisions. And, and goals we set for ourselves largely because, well, let me give you another one. It was originally conceived, you may not recall this, Fritz, but it was originally conceived that we were going to make the 18 or 20 machines in the laboratory, one at a time. We were going to, you know, ship maybe four or five a year, mm -hmm. something like mm -hmm. that. And... Midway through the first year, I sat down with Ed Garvey, who at that time was the release engineer. Yeah. And we had a long talk. We took a whole day just talking about the relative advantages of doing it that way as opposed to going into manufacturing. And finally, at the end of the day, he and I decided that the smartest thing to do was to get the factory involved. That was a good decision. Because the, uh, well, it was a good decision from a number of points of view. 